think Mariah is. that is involved with running a place like that and paying all that money back and making a profit. It's just, it, to me, it's unconscionable. Because there's no, there's just no reason in the world for all that money to be spent for the little bit of benefit. Class is ready to start. Good morning. My name is Deborah Laraway, and I'll be your moderator for this class. And welcome to the Pattern of the Universe, a school of the highest learning, this is, and not a church. We are a nonprofit, non denominational, religious, and scientific research organization dedicated to showing proof the existence of Yahweh, our Elohim, and his eternal pattern, purpose, and plan from eternity to this present day. Now, the school is a result of a divine vision and revelation given to our founder, Dr. Henry Clifford Kinley, in the state of Ohio in the year 1931. The Lansing branch was established in 1973. The dean is Dr. Terry Wells, and the president is Dr. Tina Pettigrew. Now, in this school, we teach and use the true, correct, original names of the Father, the Word or Son, and the Holy Spirit, which are contained in the original Hebrew text. Now, the name of the Father is Yahweh. He has been improperly substituted by Lord. The title for the Word or Son is Elohim. It has been improperly substituted by God. The name of the Holy Spirit manifested in or out of the physical body is Yahshua. It has been erroneously substituted with Jesus. Now, Lord and God are titles, they are not names. The Apostle Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit in 1 Corinthians 8 and 5, writes that there are Lord's many and God's many. But we now know that each Lord must have a name and each God must have a name also. Now, Elohim is a title, but unlike Lord and God, Elohim is a divine title. That means Elohim is a title that Yahweh had chose for himself. Now, Jesus is a name, but is an erroneous name. A minor investigation on your part in a good dictionary or encyclopedia would prove that there's no letter J in the Hebrew language, the Greek language, nor the Latin language, or any characters or letters in the alphabet that would produce the sound that is made by this letter J. Neither was there a letter J in the English language till some 14 to 1600 years after the Messiah's death. So such names as Jesus and Jehovah are impossible renderings for the true and correct name of our Heavenly Father and His Son. Christ is a title just like Lord and God. Now Yahweh is spirit. And in His pure spirit state, He is incomprehensible and inscrutable. He is the ultimate source, substance, limits, and bounds of all things. Now we have Yahweh on this chart symbolized as a cloud. Now Yahweh is not a cloud. He merely chose a cloud to represent himself because a cloud has no particular or descriptive shape and form. Now, we extended the cloud all around the edges of this chart. 
to show you that everything on this chart is within the cloud. Like manner, everything in the universe abides within the pure spirit state of Yahweh. Yahweh, knowing that man could not perceive of him in this pure spirit state, took on shape and took on form right within himself as Elohim. This is the word or son, a super incorporeal being that is having the shape and form of a man, but without flesh and blood. This form can only be seen in divine visions and understood in divine revelations. Later on, this self-same spirit manifested himself in a physical body and walked the earth plane as Yahshua Messiah, whom the whole world calls Jesus Christ. Now, there's only one name given unto salvation, and we must know that name. So the simple yet intelligent question we should all ask ourselves is, what was the name of Messiah at the time he walked the earth plane? A further understanding of this name and title can be found by reading the preface of the Holy Name Bible. Now, Yahweh, knowing that man could not perceive him in this period, of, oh, no. Also in this school, we show proof how. Okay, also in this school, we teach by the divine pattern because it's Yahweh's pattern. After Yahweh led the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt, he called Moses of top of Mount Sinai and showed him the tabernacle pattern in a vision. Yahweh instructed Moses to build one exactly like it in the wilderness of Sinai. This tabernacle consisted of a most holy place, a holy place, and a court round about. These three compartments make up the one tabernacle pattern. In this school, we show proof how that everything in the universe is made and operates by the structure and the function of this threefold tabernacle pattern, and that absolutely nothing escapes this pattern. The primary constitutional objectives and aims of our class are as follows. First is to help you find and know Yahweh, our Elohim, as he really is and actually exists. Second is to form a nucleus of universal brotherhood of humanity in Yahshua Messiah without distinction of race, nationality, creed, sex, caste, or color. Third is to investigate the unexplained spirit law or the so-called law of nature and the powers laden in man. Fourth is to encourage and promote the study of scriptures, comparative religion, psychology, philosophy, modern, practical, and occult science. Fifth is to extirpate current superstition, skepticism, and ignorance. Sixth, to learn, know, and understand the operation of Yahweh's eternal purpose through the dispensations and ages. Eighth is to earnestly contend. Oh, seven, sorry, seven, to discern and avoid being deceived by Lucifer, the, dirt, the serpent, the devil, the dragon, or Satan and his demons, operating the mystery of iniquity on earth through the dispensations of time. Eighth is to earnestly contend for the common salvation and faith which was once delivered unto the sons or children of Yahweh. Ninth, to make known that Yahweh from the beginning ordained there is no other name given among men whereby man must be saved, save in the name of Yahshua, the Messiah. And tenth, to inherit eternal life now in the kingdom of Yahshua, Messiah, with the hope of immortal glorification in the new earth state. Our watchword is peace, and our slogan is speak the truth. At this time, we'll have a prayer by Dr. Janice Welsh. Our scripture lesson for today will be Genesis 14, chapter, to be read by Dr. Susan Craig. Good morning, class. <clears throat> Let's bow our hearts and minds and give praise and honor to Yahshua the Messiah for bringing us into this glorious gospel that we may know, learn, and understand him as he really is and how he actually exists. We ask that you open our hearts and minds and give us an even greater understanding of your son, Yahshua the Messiah. Let us all say hallelujah. Good morning. 
I'll be reading Genesis, the 14th chapter from the Holy Name Bible, containing the Holy Name version of the Old and New Testament, critically compared with ancient authorities and various manuscripts revised by the late A. B. Trana, the Scripture Research Association, brand, uh, reprinted by Yahshua Promotions. And it came to pass in the days of Amraphel, king of Shinar, Ariok, king of Elisar, Shador Lemur, Shador Lemur, king of Elam, and title king of nations, that these made war with Bera, king of Sodom, and with Bersha, king of Gomorrah, and Shinab, king of Adma, and Shemember, king of Zeboam, and king of Bela, which is Zoar. All these were joined together in the Vale of Siddim, which is the Salt Sea. Twelve years they served Shador Lemur, and in the thirteenth year they rebelled, and in the fourteenth year came Shador Lemur, and the kings that were with him, and smote the Raphims in Ashtaroth, Carnaim, and the Zuzims in Ham, and the Emims in the plains of Kirathaim and in the Horites in their Mount Seir, unto the plains of Paran, which is by the wilderness. And they returned and came to En Mishpat, which is Kadesh, and smote all the country of the Amalekites, and also the Amorites that dwell in Hazan Tamar. And there went out the king of Sodom, and the king of Gomorrah, and the king of Admah, and the king of Zeboam, and the king of Bela, and the same as Zoar, and they joined battle with them in the vale of Siddim with Shador Le Leomer, the king of Elam, and the title king of nations, and Amraphel, king of Shinar, and Ariok, king of Elazar, four kings with five. And the vale of Siddam was full of slime pits, and the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled and fell there, and they, and they that remained fled to the mountain. And they took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their victuals and went their way. And they took Lot, Abram's brother's son, whom dwelt in Sodom, and his goods, and departed. And there came one that had escaped, and told Abram, the Hebrew, for he dwelt in the plain of Mamre, the Amorite, brother of Eschol, and brother of Aner, and these were confederate with Abram. And when Abram heard that his brother was taken captive, and he armed his trained servants, born in his own house, 318, and pursued, and pursued them unto Dan, and he divided himself against them and he and his servants by night and smote them and pursued them unto Hobah, which is, in, which is on the left hand of Damascus. And he brought back all the goods and also brought again his brother Lot and his goods and the women also and the people. And the king of Sodom went out to meet him after his return from the slaughter of Shedolaomer and of the kings that were with him at the valley of Sheba, which is the king's dale. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of El El Elyon. And he blessed him and, and said, Blessed be Abram of El Elyon, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be El Elyon, which hath delivered thine enemies into thy hand. And he gave him tithes of all. And the king of Sodom and said unto Abram, Give me the persons and take the goods to thyself. And Abram said to the king, of Sodom, I have lifted up mine hand unto Yahweh El Elyon, the possessor of heaven and earth, that I will not take from a thread to, the, to a shoe latchet, and that I will not take anything that is thine, lest thou shouldest say, I have made Abram rich, save only that which the young men have eaten, and the portion of the men which went with me, Aner, Eschol, and Mamre, let them take their portion. Genesis, the 14th chapter. Good morning. Uh, I'd like to remind everyone to silence their cell phones and their electronic devices so our class is not disturbed. And our first speaker for this morning will be Dr. Andy Craig.
caught it. Goodness gracious. I'm twisted. <laughs> well, I hope Yasha straightens me out. Good morning. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here, and it's a wonderful thing to have a knowledge and understanding that we've received through this divine vision and revelation that was given to Dr. Henry Clifford Kinley. And uh, it's important that. Uh, we understand the things that Yahweh has given us through this divine vision. And the one thing that I kind of wanted to focus on is the tabernacle pattern. So go over and get Exodus 25 and start at 8. I might. I'll get it. Now, After the children of Israel, the night of the Passover and the stench and darkness, and when they were coming out of the land of Egypt down here, and, and it was three days to the Red Sea, and they resurrected through the Red Sea into the wilderness of Sinai and journeyed to Mount Sinai, where they encamped at the, the mount there, and they were instructed to uh, clean up for three days and prepare for the speaking down of the law. And Yahweh Elohim spoke down that law from the Mount Sinai into the hearing of the children of Israel and told Moses to come up into the mountain and be there and he was going to give him tables of stone. Well, Moses' his first trip was the He was told to have the children of Israel prepare for the speaking down of the law. And then Moses' second trip is when, uh, go, go, go and get it, uh, go to uh, Exodus 24, 1, 2, and then 9 and through 18. Exodus 24, 1, 2, mm -hmm. and 9. Mm -hmm. And he said unto Moses, Come up unto Yahweh, thou Aaron, Nahab, and Abihu, and now, the seventy elders of Israel. Now you see that illustrated on this chart, and we know that uh, a good illustration is worth more than just words, right? They always say a picture is worth a thousand words. Mm -hmm. So it says, Then went up Moses, and Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and here they are, and seventy of the elders of Israel, go ahead. And worship ye afar off. Now they worshiped afar off. Go ahead. And Moses alone shall come up near Yahweh. Now it says Moses alone shall come near Yahweh. So these seventy elders and this Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu are not supposed to come near. Just Moses alone. Read on. But they shall not come nigh, neither shall the people go up with him. And Moses came and told the people all the words of Yahweh and all the judgments. And all the people answered with one voice and said, All the words which Yahweh had spoke, which he had said, we will do. Okay, drop down to the ninth verse. Ninth verse. Then went up Moses, Aaron, and Nahab, and Abihu, and the seventy elders of Israel. So then went up Moses, Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, and the seventy elders of Israel. Read on. And they saw the Elohim of Israel. Now, it says here that they saw the Elohim of Israel. Go ahead. And there was under his feet, as it were, a paved work of a sapphire stone. So we're getting a description of what they saw. It says, under his feet was a paved work of a sapphire stone. Now there's a scripture that goes with that. It says that heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. All right, so it proves out what they saw up there. Go ahead. And as it were, the body of heaven in its clearness. And upon the nobles of the children of Israel, he laid not his hand. So it was a body of heaven in its clearness or in its brilliance. And upon the nobles of the children of Israel, he laid not his hand. Read on. Also they saw Elohim and did eat and drink. Now they saw Elohim and they did eat and drink. Go ahead. And Yahweh said unto Moses, come up to me into the mount and be there. Now he's telling Moses to come up into the mount and be there. Read on. And I will give thee a table of stone, 
and a law and commandments which I have written that thou mayest teach them. So he's going to go up into the mount before Yahweh Elohim and be there and he's going to give him tables of stone. Well, this is Moses' second principal trip into Mount Sinai where Moses receives the tables of stone from Yahweh Elohim and sees the vision of Yahweh Elohim, the tabernacle pattern, and then sees the vision of the creation for seven days until for those seven days and seven nights, okay? So, and then the next 33 days that he's up here in this uh, second most important vision, he sees how to construct this tabernacle pattern. So go over to Exodus 25 and 8. And Yahweh Elohim transforms into this thoroughly furnished threefold tabernacle pattern. Seeing he can do that because Elohim is the archetype or the original pattern of the universe. All right. Now, that might surprise people that Yahweh Elohim has and is a pattern. But this is, this, the evidence for it is indisputable, and, and we're going to try and get into that a little bit. So Exodus 25 and 8. Exodus 25 and 8. <coughs> and let them make me a sanctuary that now I might... Now this is who's speaking here. Remember who, where, what, when, why, right? Who's speaking here? Yahweh Elohim is speaking here. And he says, let them make me a sanctuary. For what purpose? That I may dwell among them. We're going to make them a sanctuary that he might dwell among them. Go ahead. Nine. According to all that I show, show thee after the pattern of the tabernacle. Now, according to all that he showed Moses up here in this vision and revelation, according to the pattern of the tabernacle. Read on. And the pattern of all the instruments thereof. And the pattern of all the instruments thereof. Now, that pattern of the tabernacle is, is illustrated here on this chart and has a most holy place, a holy place, and a court round about. Now, that's three tabernacles, right? No. 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 That's just one tabernacle. And what it testifies to is that Yahweh, Elohim, and Yahshua are one. They are a unity. They are not a trinity. Okay, go ahead and read. Even so shall ye make it. Ten. And they shall make an ark of shittim wood, two cubits and a half. Now, we're going to get into the vessels that are in the tabernacle. Now, what we want to see first is an overall of the tabernacle pattern. And we're going to find out that this is 150 feet long, or it says in the, in the Bible that it's 100 cubits long. All right, the length of it here, it's 150 feet long. And the breadth of it this direction here is 75 feet or 50 cubits, all right? Now, it describes the pillars. This is for the court roundabout, which is illustrated. I'm going to move this over some. Which is an overall view of it is pictured right here, where you see the court roundabout with this little structure inside that is the most holy place and the holy place, which the high priest had to officiate within this tabernacle pattern. Now, uh, the thing that uh, we want to look at first is let's, we can look at the vessels, and you can read there about the first vessel. It's the Ark of the Covenant, which is up here in the most holy place. All right, And it gives you dimensions of this Ark of the Covenant. Now, the Ark of the Covenant is just like a, like a footlocker. Okay, it's a, and it says that uh, Moses built that, and then it, it was covered, overladen with gold. All the fixture, all the uh, furnishings within the tabernacle in the most holy place on the holy place are gold, and the ones out here in the court roundabout are made of brass. All right, and brass looks like gold, but it doesn't have the same valuation that gold has. This is a higher valuation. All right, so. We're going to go ahead, Exodus 25, what is it, 9 or 10? 10, the rest of 10. Now, the scriptures are right up here, aren't they? Yeah, Exodus 25, 10 through 12. Go ahead. This is the Ark okay. of the Covenant. And there's some special things about the vessels that are in the tabernacle. Uh, one of the members of the class went over the outside dimensions of the tabernacle and did a very nice job. The, the, what we want to look at is the inside vessels that are in the tabernacle because they have some, there's, Put it this way, there's some divine things about them. Mm -hmm. All right, so go ahead and read 25 and 10. Exodus 25 and 10. 
and they shall make an ark of shittim wood, two cubits and a half the length thereof. Now they're going to make an ark of shittim wood. What are they going to do? They're going to make a box. Now it says that, it, go ahead. That and, um, that and a half, I'm oh, sorry. A two cubit cubits, and a half. Two cubits and a half the length thereof. The length thereof is two cubits and a half, which is 45 inches. Now that's, that's the breadth of it this way, is two cubits and a half. A cubit being from your elbow to your outstretched arm, or approximately 18 inches, all right? Now, the, the curious thing about that is, if a cubit is 18 inches, if you take the one and the eight and add them together, what do you get? Nine. Nine. Wow, wait a minute. That's a special number, folks. That's how many divine attributes, principal divine attributes, Yahweh Elohim did to form, to fuse into Yahweh Elohim, who's the archetype pattern of the universe. There's nine principal divine attributes. And you'll find here that this, a cubit is 18 inches, or it adds up to nine, showing the divine nature that we're talking about here. So the length of it was 45 inches. Or is, is two and a half cubits, as it says right there in Exodus, the, ten, the uh, 25th chapter, 10th verse. 45, that's, that's 45 inches. Well, four and five is what? Nine. Now, again, a nine. We're going to keep seeing this nine repeat over and over and over and over, folks. And it's going to show us that this is of a divine nature. No man thought this up. Moses did not decide to build this on his own. And you'll notice that the measurements in the Bible are given in cubits. But where we change those cubits over to inches. Now, inches originate as a measurement of the king's body. The king of where? Well, it was the king of England at the time, see, but it's measurements of the king's body because um, they, they used that instead of using cubits. So this was an inch right here from knuckle to knuckle on your hand. That was an inch. Mm -hmm. And then this, why do you call this a foot? And don't we call that a foot? A foot. And then three feet makes what? A yard. These are, these, this is the measurements that are, and, and you know what's funny is, is the United States is the only major country in the world that still use the, uh, the, what's called the royal measurement system. They tried to change us over to, to uh, the metric system years ago, but we just, we, we couldn't do it. We just didn't want to go there. And we were stubborn about it. And so we still have the English system here, the inches and feet, right? No, so when we, and, and this is why. This vision and revelation of the and revelation of the tabernacle pattern. This is why we still have the inch system in the United States of America and did not go to the metric system. Mm -hmm. This is why. So it's two and a half cubits of, is the length of it, and that's forty-five inches. The width of it is one and a half cubits. Well, one and a half cubits in inches is twenty-seven, and there is a nine again. Two and seven is nine. This is the divine nature that, this is the divine proof that this tabernacle is, is real and was, had Yahweh Elohim had the children of Israel build it back here for his dwelling place in the wilderness of Sinai. Now, the, the height of it was also a cube, one and a half cubits, and then again, that's 27 inches. Now, the Ark of the Covenant was in the most holy place. The most holy place was constructed of pillars, bars, and boards that went around it right here. And the board length are 15 feet tall. The boards are 15 feet tall. I mean, oh, well, that's probably about the height of the ceiling in here, isn't it? Huh? It's higher than that? Okay, this we're ceiling is... So that's... That... that, that uh, let me see. Oh, 10 cubits is what it is in, in cubits. And that's in Exodus. Go to, go to Exodus 26 and 15. Exodus 26 and 15. And thou shalt make boards for the tabernacle of Shittim wood standing up. Now you're making boards because the tabernacle, the most holy place in the holy place, was, was put together with pillars, bars, and boards. And we can get into the supporting structures of that because there's 60 boards. There's 20 bars and 69 pillars, which makes 149, which correlates to the year that they were 
here in the wilderness of Sinai, which is 1490 BBY. Okay, so that's the pillars, bars, and boards. The pillars, bars, and boards also show the bone structure of a man which represents the pillars, bars, and boards in the tabernacle pattern. And if we'll have, we might get into that if we'll take a moment. So the boards were, go ahead, 26 and 15. 16, 10 cubits. Oh, wait, am I doing the Ark of the Covenant or am I? No, you're on the boards. Okay. Um, we did the Ark of the 16. Covenant. <laughs> go ahead. 26 and uh, 16. So they're 10, 10 cubits cub high, right? Mm -hmm. so that, or, or that translates into 15 feet or 180 inches. Remember we were talking about how the numerals add up to nine? There it is again. And this is gonna repeat over and over and over again. So the most holy place here was put together with these 15 foot boards. Now the most holy place just happens to be 15 feet cubed. In other words, the boards are 15 feet high. The most holy place is 15 feet wide and it's 15 feet long. So it's a cubicle structure that's, that's 15 by 15 by 15. And if that's that 15 feet or 180 inches, which is, shows that nine again. Now, uh, we're gonna look into what's the vessels in the holy place down here. And what's in the holy place is, first of all, is this, uh, when you're coming downward like this, there's the altar of incense. And you can go over to Exodus, the 30th chapter, and the first through tenth verse. This is where the, the altar of incense, which you can see pictured here, where the high priest had to light incense every time he, he had to officiate in the tabernacle pattern, which he did twice a day for 9 a.m. and 3 p.m. Exodus 30 and 1. And thou make, a, make an altar to burn incense upon, of shittim wood shalt thou make it. Now here's this altar. We're going to make it of shittim wood. Go ahead. You want the 30th verse now? Thir Exodus 30, 1 through 10. Oh, 1 through 10, okay. Yep. Oh, it is on. Two, a cubic shall be its length, and a cubic its breadth. Now, it's going to be one cubit length, and one cubit wide, and one cubit, okay, so that one cubit, that's 18 inches. What's one and eight? Nine. You've got another nine. This, it, this, it, this is divine in nature, folks. And now how high is it? Keep going. Four squares shall it be, and two cubits shall it be, be its height. Now it's going to be two cubits high. Two cubits high is 36 inches. Three and six? Nine. Nine again. <laughs> and this, remember, this is a golden overlaid with gold, made of shittim wood and overlaid with gold, and it has four horns on it, and it has the pot of incense on top of it. Go ahead. Its horns shall be of the same, and thou shalt overlay it with pure gold, its top and its sides, round about, and its horns, and thou shalt make it onto, a, make it onto, make onto it a crown of gold round about. So it has a, four horns and a crown of gold around the top. Go ahead. And two golden rings shall thou make to, to it under the crown of it. By the two edges thereof, upon the two sides of it, shall thou make it. They shall be for places for the staves to bear it. So there it's going to have staves to bear it, okay? Yes. Well, let's move on to the next uh, uh, vessel in the tabernacle pattern. We go down here to the table of shoe bread, which is Exodus 25 and 23 through 30. We're going to look at the measurements of this table of shoe bread. And for these vessels up here in the most holy place and the holy place are overlaid or made of gold. Go ahead. Exodus 25 and 23. Thou shalt make a table of shittim wood. Two cubits shall be the length thereof. Now the length of it is two cubits. Two cubits is 36 inches, three and six. Another nine, keep going. And a cubit, the breadth thereof. Now it's going to be a cubit, the breadth thereof. That's 18 inches, one and eight. There's that nine again. Go on. And a cubit and a half, the height thereof. Now a cubit and a half is going to be the height thereof. A cubit and a half is 27 inches. Well, two and seven is nine again. 
We got this nine going on, don't we? It just keeps repeating and repeating and repeating. Get it? Are we? Are we? Were we making getting it through our heads that there's nine divine attributes that Yahweh brought together into Yahweh, shape and form as Yahweh Elohim? Uh, 25 and 31, and thou shalt make a candlestick of pure gold. Now you're going to make this a pure gold. This isn't made with shittim wood over covered with gold. This is made with pure gold. Read on. Of beaten work shall the candlestick be made. Its base and its shafts, its bowls, its knobs, and its flowers shall be of the same. Uh huh. And the six branches shall come off of the sides of it three branches of the candlestick out of one side and three branches of the candlestick out of the other side. Now, you know what? We don't have any dimensions for that, so we don't know how big it was. It could have stood from the floor to, to this tall. We don't, we, don't, we don't know. The dimensions are not listed in there. Now, there's, there, you could say there's a reason that they're not listed in there. It's because the candlestick is what gave light in here to the holy place. Okay? And the tip of, it's, it's, it's a type and shadow of Yahshua the Messiah, who is the light of the world. All right? So we don't have measurements for that. Um, let's go down to the laver. We don't have measurements for the laver either. Okay? They aren't, there aren't any, any measurements listed in Exodus. So go down to the altar of burnt offering, which is Exodus 27, 1 through 8. Exodus 27 and 1. And thou shalt make the altar of shittim wood. Now, I we're going to make this altar, and this is the altar of sin sacrifice that you see down here in the court roundabout. Okay, go ahead. Five cubits long and five cubits broad. Now it's five cubits long and five cubits wide. In other words, it's five cubits square. All right? Five cubits equals 90 inches. There's that nine again. Go ahead. The altar shall be four square and, and the height thereof shall be three cubits. The height thereof is three cubits. Well, that's 54 inches. If you take 18 and multiply it by 3, you get 54 inches, and 5 and 4 is 9 again. Go ahead. And thou shalt make the horns of it upon the four corners now it's thereof. Have four corners, four horns on, uh, on the corners thereof, and the, where they have to place the blood of the sacrifice on the four corners of the, the horns on this altar of sin sacrifice. Go ahead. Its horn shall be of the same. And thou shalt overlay it with brass. Now, this is a vessel that's made of brass. The vessels out here in the court roundabout were brazen in nature, while the ones up here were golden in nature. Now, the dimensions of the tabernacle from the gate, which is 30 feet wide. Now, 30 feet wide corresponds to the age that the Messiah was when he came to John to be baptized here in the wilderness of Judea in the River Jordan. It's, it says in John, uh, what is it, is it? He was about 30 years old when he came to be baptized. It's also the age of the priest had to be to officiate in the tabernacle pattern. That's why Yah, that's a type and shadow of Yahshua the Messiah. Now, from the gate, to the door, which is uh, up here in the holy place, which the door is three feet wide, okay, is 70 feet. And that is the length of from the gate to the altar of sin sacrifice, to the laver, and then to where the pr high priest stood before he was anointed, which is one foot from the door, is 23 feet and 23 feet and 23 feet, which is 69 feet, plus the one foot before the high priest uh, stood at the door when he was uh, anointed to officiate within the tabernacle pattern. So it's 70 feet from the gate to the door. Okay? Now, what that corresponds, and, and, and we can see something in that 70 feet, okay? Because this tabernacle pattern, just like this chart we have here on the dispensations and ages, which just, it just happens to go by the tabernacle pattern. 
Isn't that amazing? It just, just, it just happens to go by the tabernacle pattern. How, what do you mean, how does it go by the tabernacle pattern? Well, look here, we have right here after this first creative age, we have the Adam in the Garden of Eden right there, okay? And that's like being at the gate of this tabernacle pattern. Now, Adam sacrificed his life for his bride when he saw that she had partaken of what she was not supposed to partake of, Adam, who saw that she had transgressed, he sacrificed his life for his bride. Type and shadow of Yahshua the Messiah, who sacrificed his life for his bride or his, the assembly. All right? Now, that corresponds to this line right here, which is at the end of the first creative age, uh, to separates the first age from the second age, which is the antediluvian age, is where Adam transgressed in the Garden of Eden. All right, so we, and then that corresponds to the altar of sin sacrifice down here. All right, where Adam was the sacrifice for his bride, just like Yahshua the Messiah is a sacrifice for his bride. Then we come through this age to the Noah and the flood here on the the division between the second antediluvian age and the third age, which is the post-diluvian age, we have all this water, right? Noah and the flood. That corresponds to right here. See the labor right here? Which is the third step into the tabernacle pattern. I didn't fail to mention the tabernacle pattern has seven steps, folks. Okay? So this is the third step where the water is. So we've got Adam. It corresponds to right here, this line between the first age and the second age, and then the flood with Noah corresponds between here, between the antediluvian age and the post-diluvian age. We come down to the next division, which is the death, burial, and resurrection of Yahshua the Messiah, and, that, and when he rose, he rose a quickening spirit, and he went and poured out the Holy Spirit uh, on the day of Pentecost corresponds to him going into the holy place. All right? Now, um, Let's look at Yahshua's mission according to the tabernacle pattern here. Go over and get uh, Exodus 25 and 22. And then Leviticus 16 and 2. Because here we can see the correspondence between the first age, which is 1,656 years long, and the dimensions of the tabernacle pattern. Because if we take right here from the gate to the laver, is 46 feet. All right? From the gate to the laver is 46 feet. Now, 46 feet in inches, anybody got their calculator? How much? 552, okay? Now if you take that 552 and multiply it times three because the labor is the third step, you're going to get 1656. Didn't we talk about that this tabernacle pattern was divinely inspired directly from Yahweh Elohim? That's how you get that 1656 years shown by the tabernacle pattern was the length of this age right here, the second antediluvian age. Now we want to look at, uh, go ahead and get those scriptures. Exodus 25, 22, Leviticus 16 and 2. Uh, Exodus 25 and 22. And there I will meet with thee, and I will commune with thee. Now, who's speaking here? Yahshua, Moses' minister, isn't he speaking here? Who is Yahweh Elohim? All right, and he's talking to Moses and he's saying, there I will meet with thee. Well, where is he talking about he's going to meet with him? He's going to meet with him on the Ark of the Covenant in the most holy place. All right, this is where there is the mercy seat or the throne, a type and shadow of the throne of Yahweh Elohim. Okay, go ahead. And there I will meet with thee and I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat. From between the two cherubims, which are upon 
the ark of the testimony. Now here you go. Here's the uh, the mercy seat, which is on the ark of the testimony. Okay, read on, and that's where Yahweh Elohim is going to meet with them. Read on. Of all things which I will give thee in commandment unto the children of Israel. Okay, Leviticus sixteen and two. Leviticus sixteen and two, and Yahweh said unto Moses. Speak unto Aaron thy brother, that he come not at all times into the holy place within the veil. Now this is a warning. Speak unto your brother Aaron, who is the first high priest to officiate in this tabernacle back here with the children of Israel in the wilderness of Sinai, that he come not at all times, read on, in the holy place within the veil. Into the most holy place, which is within the veil. Before Look at the here. mercy seat. He was only supposed to go in there on the day of atonement, right? He did not go in there every day. He did not go in there every month. He only went in there one time a year on the Day of Atonement. Okay? Now, because that's where uh, Yahweh's throne is, is upon the mercy seat. He will appear in the cloud above the mercy seat. Uh, Isaiah 66 and 1. And what we're, so, we're, what we're showing here, or illustrating, that Yahweh Elohim, when the children of Israel built this tabernacle in the wilderness of Sinai here, was for his dwelling place among the children of Israel. Okay? This is where he would be. And we're showing... That, okay, read... read Isaiah 66 and 1. Thus saith Yahweh, the heaven is my throne. Now he says... Heaven is his throne, read on. And the earth is my footstool. And didn't we just read about that, that he that he's, he's had a body in its clearness and upon the, uh, he had standing on a sapphire stone right there? So heaven, go ahead. Where heaven is, is the house that you built unto me? And where is the place of my rest? Okay, uh, John 3.13. What I'm trying to show you here is that Yahweh Elohim or Yahshua dwelling in the most holy place would appear upon the mercy seat. This is where he, he would dwell at. Okay? Now, what happens is, is um, John 3.13. John, John 3.13. And, and no man hath ascended up to heaven but he that come down from heaven. Now, no man has ascended up and from ascended to heaven, but he that came down from heaven. See, Yahshua the Messiah was up here in heaven. He's, he's not, when he was walking around during his ministry, he told him right on the face that he was in heaven standing right there in front of him. He never left heaven. He's always in heaven. Read on. Even the Son of Man, which was in heaven, uh -huh. And Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. Even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Go to John 6 and 38. John 6 and 38. For I come down from heaven. Now this is what we want to see. This is where Yahshua dwelt. Right here on the mercy seat between the wings of the cherubim. Right? But now he's going to come down and this is a type and shadow of being in heaven. All right? He's going to come down from heaven. Read on. Not to do mine own will. Not to do his own will. He didn't come down to do his own will. He came down to do the will of the Father. Read on. But the will of him that, ha that sent me. All right. So we want to see Yahshua's mission according to the tabernacle pattern. And we're going to see him, his dwelling place is here. But what he's going to do, he's going to come down into the earth plane. Now, what we want to see from the dimensions of the tabernacle, all right, is he's coming down from the most holy place, the Ark of the Covenant, which is the seventh step, right? Okay, now he's coming down, and it, this is 15 feet by 15 feet by 15 feet. If he's on the Ark of the Covenant and he's going to come to out into the holy place from there, he's going to travel seven and a half feet, right? Well, seven and a half feet is how many cubits? Five. 90 inches, which is five cubits. What we want to look at at that is 90 inches. All right, so we're coming down 90 inches to 
the division, the second veil, between the most holy place and the holy place. And then from there, the second veil, all the way down to the gate, it's on here somewhere, gate to second veil, is 100 feet or 1,200 inches. Now, in the end, towards the end, we're going to add these things up. He started at the seventh step, so we got seven, and then we have that fifth, fifth seven and a half feet, which is, which, which is what, 90 inches? And then it's how many feet, how many inches from, it's, and it's 1,200 inches from the second veil to the gate, right? So he's coming down from the seventh step, and he's coming down 1,290 inches, right? So that's 1,290 inches. And that shows Yahshua coming down from heaven during his ministry. All right? Now, um, this gate down here has, is 30 feet wide, but it also has 10 pillars, and that corresponds to the 10 plagues that they had down here in the land of Egypt before they came out of the land of Egypt. Um, numbers 4 and 3. And then Luke, 20, Luke 3 and 23. Because what in type and shadow, what Yahshua is going to do now, according to the tabernacle pattern, is he's come down off the mercy seat, come out here into the world to, to do the will of the Father. And, and what he's going to do is he's making his way back up by the tabernacle pattern. That's the mission of Yahshua the Messiah. Because down here at the gate, uh, if you read Luke 3 and 23. Luke 3 and 23. And Yahshua himself began to be about 30 years of age. Now, it says he's about 30 years of age. Okay? And now, in type and shadow, that's how old the priest had to be before he could officiate in the tabernacle here. He had to be 30 years of age. So here's Yahshua. This is an institution, and Yahshua's going to fulfill it. Go ahead. He's about 30 years of age. As, being, go ahead. Being, as was supposed, the son of Joseph. As was supposed, the son of Joseph. Because truly, he's Yahweh Elohim. He's, he is the son of Yahweh Elohim. Um, Matthew seven thirteen and 14. Matthew 7 and 13? 7, 13 and 14. Okay. Matthew 7 and 13. Enter ye in by the narrow gate. Now, you're reading from a Holy Name version, aren't yeah. you? King James says, enter ye in by the straight gate. And here it is. Here's the gate on the tabernacle pattern right here. All right, so you're going to enter in. He's going to come all the way down from heaven and then enter in at the straight gate because he is the true uh, high priest of the whole, of everything that this high priest back here in the wilderness of Sinai in this tabernacle was only a type and shadow of. All right, but Yahshua is the true high priest. So go ahead. Um, Enter ye in at the version. straight gate. Yep, in the King James Version. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. So let's see, wide is the gate down here, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, because the first thing you come to is this altar, a sin sacrifice, where there was a fire continually burning to burn up the sacrifice, you see? So, you, and if you come up here, and, and go ahead and get on the altar right there, you're going to be destroyed. Okay, okay, wide is the gate, and... It leads to de leads to destruction, and then and many there be which straight is the gate. I'll read it off here. And narrow is the way which leadeth to life. What's he talking about? He's talking about coming up here into the holy place where where he said, "Stand in the holy place, 
folks, because this is a wide opening down here. This is a narrow opening up here. This is three feet up here. This is 30 feet up down here. This is 10 times as wide as that is down here. All right? So that's, that's the fulfillment of that scripture in the describing of how this tabernacle pattern fits the whole show, folks. All right? So that's the gate. Turn the page. And the first thing you come to is the altar of sin sacrifice, right? Now, go over and get, uh, well, we don't need to read Exodus 27 where we have an altar of shittim wood because we just read that earlier when we were going through the dimensions of it. Um, okay. Um, get Exodus 40 and 29. And then Hebrews 10 and 1. Exodus 40 and 29. And he put the altar of burnt offering by the door of the tabernacle, the tent of the congregation. So there in Exodus, the 40th chapter, Moses is setting, it's the one who's setting up the tabernacle now, okay? And he's going to put this altar of sin sacrifice right here, which is 23 feet from the gate. Now that also corresponds to the uh, axis that the earth spins on. All right? Because so, heaven is my throne. Earth is my footstool. You have no, that, that the axis that the earth spins on just happens to be 23 degrees, folks. And that's what gives us the seasons of the year. Okay? So go ahead, where, were, where, have you, where you were. And he put the altar of burnt offering by the door of the tabernacle of the tent of the congregation and offered upon it the burnt offering and the meal offering as Yahweh commanded Moses. So that's where he's going to put the offering is on this tabernacle pattern. And Yahshua the Messiah be a type, be the, those offerings that they did back in the wilderness of Sinai being a type and shadow of Yahshua the Messiah, who's the true offering for salvation down here. Get uh, John in 129. John 1 and 29. The next day John seeth Yahshua coming unto him and saith, Behold, the Lamb of Yahweh, which now, take away the sin of the world. wait a minute, wait a minute. John sees Yahshua the Messiah coming to him. Is he like, look like a lamb? <laughs> Is he walk on all fours? Does he have a, a, a coat that look made out of lamb skin that's all, no. Why is John calling him a lamb? Because John had a vision and a revelation, folks, and go ahead, start it over. The next day John seeth Yahshua coming unto him, and saith, Behold, the Lamb of Yahweh, which taketh away the sins of the world. Now he's saying that by revelation to him, okay? That's why he's saying, Behold, the Lamb of Yahweh. And Yahshua being the Lamb of Yahweh, the Lamb was sacrificed down here on the altar of a burnt offering. So you see that Yahshua's coming up through the gate at 30 to the altar, and he's going to be baptized to John, which corresponds to the labor. He's making his way up the tabernacle, the divine tabernacle pattern. Um, go to Hebrews 10 and 1. Hebrews 10 and 1. Now remember who wrote Hebrews, which is Paul, who had a vision and a revelation on the road to Damascus which completely changed him from persecuting the assembly of Yahweh to being the most and brightest and best advocate for the gospel of Yahshua the Messiah. All right? So there was a big change in Paul, and they were afraid of him at first. But after, after he had, had his, it, his been preaching the gospel of Yahshua, had been, I mean, they tried to kill this man time and time again, and they could never get him. Um, Hebrews uh, 10 and 1. Hebrews 10 and 1. For the law having a shadow of good things to come. Now the law, we're talking about this law that was given back here to the Jews and the Jews only that Yahweh Elohim spoke down from Mount Sinai and Moses got the ten command, the top ten on the tables of stone. But really this had uh, over 600 laws that was attached to it, you see. So this is the law that we're talking about. It isn't a law that the Gentiles had. The Gentiles were never under this law. It was given to the Jews and the Jews only back here in the wilderness of Sinai. All right, go ahead. And not the very image of the things can never 
can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the corners there the covers there unto perfect so this Comers. law couldn't make the covers there unto perfect go ahead read on and this law is a type and a shadow folks but Yahshua the Messiah came in to fulfill this law now fulfill means to right here he came to end this law of carnal ordinances and physical sacrifices but because this is a type and a shadow folks this was never the reality this is the reality down here and this is the was given to the Jews and the Jews only this is given to the Jews and the Gentiles all right go um, so uh, go to Exodus uh, 12 and 3 through 10 Oh, we didn't finish the Hebrews, did we? I'll read it. But in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance, again, made it sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and the blood of goats should take away sins. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. Okay, he prepared that body for him to come down in. This was a prepared sacrificial body. That's why, and that's, you hear, that's why John called him the Lamb of Yahweh. Then he said, Lo, I come to do thy will, O Yahweh. He taketh away the first that he may establish the second, by which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Yahshua once for all. And every, high, every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never which could never take away sin but this man after he had offered one sacrifice for sin forever sat down on the right hand of Yahweh all right um, now oh, we just had that revelation 5 and 6 So Yahshua, who is the king of kings, came down from heaven and then comes back through the gate. He is the sacrifice that is meant to save everyone for the, the sins of the world. He is the washed, baptized in the water of John in fulfillment that his baptism takes care of everyone. And he comes up through the gate here into the holy place. Um, and that, well, go to Leviticus 1 and 9. Because he's going to come up through the labor. And this is showing that Yahshua was baptized by John here in the River Jordan. Leviticus 1 and 9. But his inwards and his legs shall he wash in water. Now he's talking about the sacrifice that was offered upon the altar back here by the high priest. All right. And this sacrifice had to be washed in water before it was put on this altar or a sin sacrifice. Just as Yahshua the Messiah at the beginning of his ministry was baptized by John in the river Jordan. Go ahead. And the priest shall burn all on the altar to be burnt to be a burnt sacrifice, an offering made by fire of a sweet Savior unto Yahweh. All right, and this, like, they burnt that <laughs> sacrifice on this altar back here, and Yahshua was roasted, uh, or heckled, picked on, mistreated, tortured, right, at the end of his ministry before he was put on the cross. So we're making our way back up here, and from... Uh, from the gate is 70 feet right here. And that 70 feet is how many inches? Where is it? Gate to the door is 70 feet, which is 840 inches. So we want to add that up over here because we're keeping track. It's 840 inches, right? And that gets us to the door. Now, well, 
well, I'm sk skipping a lot of sc scriptures here. But let me see what I'm looking for. Make the laver and watch them. Because Moses had to wash the Aaron, his brother, the high priest and the low priest with water before they could officiate in this tabernacle back here in the wilderness of Sinai. Right? Um, trying to find where I have that. Galatians 3.24 And then Exodus 28 and 41. Galatians 3 and 4. No, 324. Oh, 324, sorry. Galatians 3 and 24. Wherefore the ceremonial law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto the Messiah that we might be justified by faith. So the ceremonial law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto the Messiah. All right, we're supposed to uh, remember the former things of old. All right, there, where is that? That's over in Isaiah. We won't get that now. Now, uh, Exodus 28 and 41. Exodus. The high priest had to be anointed, he had to be washed with water and be anointed before he could officiate within this tabernacle back here. Go ahead. Exodus 25 and 41. And thou shalt put them upon Aaron thy brother and his sons with him, and shalt anoint them and consecrate them and sanctify them that they may minister unto me in the priest's office. So they're going to minister him un, uh, in the priest's office. They have to be anointed with oil. And at Yahshua's baptism, back here, uh, it's at John 1 and 32. John 1 and 32. And John bore record, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him. And I knew him not, but he that sent me to immerse with water, the same said unto me. So John saw the likeness of a dove, right? Coming down on Yahshua the Messiah after he was baptized, right? And that's like the high priest had to be anointed with oil here at the door before he could officiate within the tabernacle. Did, you, did we get that right? Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him. Now, upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him. Go ahead. The same is he which shall immerse you with the Holy Spirit. Now, he's going to immerse you with the Holy Spirit. And that's likened unto that holy anointing oil, okay, that he had right there. Um, Exodus 30 and 30 is the scripture where it says, Thou shalt anoint Aaron and his sons and consecrate them that they may minister unto me in the priest's office. And you'll take the anointing oil. Okay? Um, Mark 1, 10 and 11. Mark 1 and 10. And, straight, and straightway coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens opened and the spirit like a dove descending upon him. And there came a voice from heaven saying, Thou art, me, thou art my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Okay, that's another witness in Mark of him being anointed of type of the anointment back here. Um... Let's see. John 10 and 9. And then Revelations 3 and 20. 
John 10 and 9. I am the door by me if any now, man... Now, who's speaking here? Joshua's speaking here. What's he saying he's the door for? Why? Because he's following the tabernacle pattern. This is the door here that comes from the court roundabout into the holy place right here. And what he said was, he's the, he was the sacrifice. He was the, uh, he was the uh, sacrifice that was, was baptized or washed in the labor. He's the uh, type of the high priest that's anointed with the, uh, the oil, like, he, like John saw the, the dove come down and, and light on him and remain. And now Yahshua is the door. So he's coming on up through this tabernacle pattern. Go ahead and read. I am the door. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. So here he says, Yahshua is the door. That's why he said this, folks. That's why he said he was the door, because he's following this tabernacle pattern. Revelation 3 and 20. Revelation 3 and 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. He if stands at the door and knocks. What, it, he's, is he knocking on the door to your house? Well, yes, he is, because this is your house and this is the door. And this is the way in right here. Okay, through the, because you have five senses, right? That's what you use. To, that's the way into your house is through those senses. You, you see and you hear and you smell, and you taste, right? So, behold, I stand at the door and knock. Read on. If any so, man hear my voice. He's knocking at the door, folks. This is the door right here. Knocking at the door. Go ahead. If any man hear my voice. And open the door, I will come in to him. He's going to come into you. Wait a minute. What happened back here on the day of Pentecost? Wasn't the Holy Spirit poured out on the, the believers back here? He will come into them. Read on. And sup with you. Mm -hmm. And sup with him. And he with me. Okay. So now he's coming back up. And we're up here. And we're into the holy place. Go over and get... Um, well, we already read about the shoe bread. Exodus 25, 23. Now, Exodus. the vessels in here, in the... Go ahead. We're going to... Because he's Exodus coming up here. Exodus 25 and 23. He's going to come up here to the table of shoe bread, folks. Right? Thou shalt also make a table of shittim wood. Two cubics shall be the length thereof, a cubic the breadth thereof, and a cubic and a half the height thereof. Okay, so we're describing the table of shoe bread. And when Yahshua's coming up by the tabernacle pattern through the door into the holy place, he's going to come up here to the uh, table of shoe bread. Go to John 6, 31 through 35. John 6, 31 through 35. Our fathers did eat manna in the desert. Well, hold on now. Our fathers did eat manna where? In the desert. Uh-huh. And that was back here, <coughs> folks, under the Mosaic law. When Yahweh Elohim rained down manna for them for 40 years, he rained down manna for them in the wilderness of Sinai. Go ahead. As it is written... He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Yahshua said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. So why are we talking about bread here? He's talking about the Father giving us the true bread from heaven. See, Yahshua is fulfilling, folks, and he's doing it by the pattern of the tabernacle. Okay, go ahead. 33. For the bread of Elohim is he which cometh down from heaven. The bread of Elohim is he which cometh down from heaven. Who came down from heaven, folks? Yahweh Elohim, who's Yahshua? He's the one that came down from heaven. So he's the bread that cometh down from heaven. Look at the allegories and the types and the shadows. Go ahead. And giveth life unto the world. He gives life unto the world, folks. Read on. Then said they unto him, Rabbi, Evermore give us this bread. Yeah. Do they know what they're saying? Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> they have no idea what they're saying. The Holy Spirit's putting words in their mouth, saying, Rabbi, give, give us this bread from heaven. We want this bread from heaven. Read on. And Yahshua said unto them, I am the bread of life. Now who? He said what? I am the bread of life. That he's the bread of life. What do you mean? You mean this is type and shadow. This is allegory. That this type, the bread that was put on this table of shoe bread here in the tabernacle pattern was a type and shadow of Yahshua the Messiah. And he's saying he's the true bread of heaven. Read on. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. How is that? You mean physically, naturally, we'll never hunger? You better get that carnal mind out of the way, folks. Because he's, he's talking from a spiritual standpoint right here. He's talking about feeding you with the Holy Spirit. Um, John 6, 48 and 51. John 6, 48. I am the bread of life. Who said that? <laughs> is that a red letter edition? So Yahshua is the bread of life. Read on. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. Now the, that's what it, see, the fathers did eat manna in the wilderness back here. And they're what? They're dead. dead. Read on. 50. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven that a man may eat thereof and not die. So this is the bread that cometh down from heaven that a man may eat from and never die. Read on. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. Who, who's, he's, he's the living bread? See, people don't understand the allegories that Yahshua's fulfilling back here, that he's setting up this whole thing, that he is the living bread that cometh down. From where? From heaven. From heaven, which is a type and shadow of coming down off the Ark of the Covenant. Go ahead. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. Now, don't we come in here to eat this bread of Yahshua the Messiah or the gospel of Yahshua the Messiah off these plates, off these charts in here, right? By the Holy Spirit speaking unto us and knocking on our door and opening up these mysteries unto us? Go ahead. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. He's giving his flesh. Sacrificed on the cross back here. 1 Corinthians 5, 7 and 8. First Corinthians 5, 7 and 8. For, <clears throat> excuse me, to deliver such no. a... 5, 7, and 8, right? First Corinthians. Oh. Yeah, okay. Get rid of, of the old leaven, it's, that you may be bread of a new baking. Got a King James Version? I'll read it. I got it right here. <laughs> Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump. What is he talking about? Purge out therefore the old leaven. Look at here. He's talking about your carnal mind. That's the old leaven. That's the old thing. But he wants to purge that out and be a baking, that you may be a new lump, with the, for ye are unleavened. It means you don't have the Holy Spirit. You're unleavened without the Holy Spirit. And that has to be risen within you. All right? Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, or the leaven of malice and wickedness, but the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Okay? Um, Oh, where we want to go. How about 1 Corinthians 11 and 27? First Corinthians 11 and 27. See, we're down here in a spiritual age now. We're not under, and we never were under, if we're, unless we're Jews, under this old law of carnal ordinances that the mystery of iniquity down here in this plate, you can see that he is dragged over that old dragon drag those carnal ordinances over into this age where they don't belong. And not only don't they belong, but he's tried to put those carnal ordinances on all mankind, both Jew and Gentile. See, and that's, it's just wrong. It's not the way it's supposed to be. Go ahead. 1 Corinthians 11 and 27. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of Yahshua unworthily 
shall be guilty of the body and blood of Yahshua. Okay, guilty of the body and blood. Go ahead. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. So drink of this bread. <clears throat> well, you we know, we got to know the difference between this and that, right? Okay. Um, we want to move on to the lampstand. Uh, we read about the construction of it earlier, so go to John 8 and 12. Because here he's doing, he's fulfilling every step coming up through there. I'll explain it in a minute. Go ahead. What do you got? John, what was it? I'm sorry. John 8 and 12. Okay. John 8 and 12. Then spake Yahshua again upon unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. Why is he he's the light of the world? What is he doing? See, he's fulfilling this tabernacle pattern back here. I am the door. I am the bread. I am the light of the world. Read on. Because what does he do? When we have the Holy Spirit put within us, see, it lights us up inside takes off the blinders of the carnal mindedness and lights us up to see the reality of Yahshua the Messiah. Go ahead. I am the light of the world. Read he, on. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness. He that followeth him. We don't walk in darkness once we have understanding. Go but ahead. shall have the light of life. And we'll have the light of life. So here we go. We got the bread. We got the light. Now we got to go where? Incense. Well, right to the altar of incense, right? And the altar of incense is... Uh, Remember, it makes a fog, right? Frankincense, Onika, Galbanum, and Stachne, right? So that sweet-smelling savor that on the um, Exodus 30 and 1. Exodus 30 and 1. And thou shalt make an altar to burn incense upon. Of shittim wood shalt thou make it. A cubic shall be its length, and a cubic its breadth. Four square sh shall it be, and the two cub cubics shall be its height. Its horns shall be of the same. Okay, so that's this altar of incense. And so he made the altar of incense, the shittim wood. Uh, Leviticus 16, 13. Leviticus 16 and 13. And he shall put the incense upon the fire before Yahweh, that the cloud of incense may cover the mercy seat that is upon the testimony that he die not. Okay, so the incense is upon the fire. Remember what happened to the uh, Nadab, was it Nadab and Abihu? They offered strange fire, not strange incense. They offered strange fire. Because what happened was, is this tabernacle had not been put up yet. Yahweh had not lit the fire that's in this altar of incense down here, altar of sin sacrifice. Not all the incense, no. And Yahweh lit the fire in this altar of sin sacrifice. And it was never to go out, folks. The perpetual fire in that altar of sin sacrifice. Because it corresponds to Yahweh, who is pure spirit manifesting in the fiery cloud, symbolizes eternity. That doesn't go out. That's a fire that's a f an eternal flame. See? Okay? So, um, I just lost my place. Where was I? Oh, altar. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> this one up here, we're up at the fogs, right? Yeah. All right, um, Acts 1 and 9. Now, the configuration of these three vessels in the most holy place has a significance. It has a significance from John on the Isle of Patmos which we can get to that because when he turns to see the voice that spake with him, 
he was in the top of a mountain, which is an island in the water, right? So here's that configuration right here. It forms this triangular configuration in the holy place, like a mountain. It's, this is where John was when he turned to saw, see the voice that spoke with him in the book of Revelation. And this is where the, uh, we're going right here to this altar of incense right here, because this altar of incense made a cloud that <coughs> ascended on into the, the most holy place. Okay, and that's what Yahshua did out here on Mount Olivet. So, um, Acts 1 and 9. Acts 1 and 9. Acts 1 and 9. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. Keep going. Yep. And while they looked steadfastly towards heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. So he ascended on a cloud back here, right? Um, 1 Timothy 2 and 5. First Timothy 2 and 5. For one is Yahweh, and one mediator between him and men, the man Yahshua the Messiah, who gave himself a ransom for all, to be testified, I mean, to, yeah, to be testified in due time, whereunto I am ordained a preacher and an apostle. I speak the truth in the Messiah, and lie not, a teacher of the nations in faith and truth. I will therefore... I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, in shame. Um, okay, but there is just one Yahweh, one mediator between Yahweh and men, and that's Yahshua the Messiah. Now, do we understand where we got these numbers? The seventh step, 1,290 inches from the Ark of the Covenant down to the gate. And then back from the gate, this is 70 feet, 80 feet, 90 feet, right? Now, uh, 90 times 12, which you convert that to inches, you should get 1,080. And what you just showed, this 2377 by Yahshua's Messiah, according to the, his mission, according to the tabernacle pattern, mm -hmm. is we just showed the length of the third or the post-Diluvian age by Yahshua's ministry in the tabernacle pattern. Mm -hmm. Now, there's other types and shadows in this tabernacle pattern also, because this old high priest back here, on the Day of Atonement, he came up from this altar, from the gate down here, to the second veil right here, right? And that's 1,200. Gate to second veil, yeah, there it is. It's 1,200 inches, right? And then he went another five feet or 60 inches into the most holy place. Now what that gives you is 1,260, right? <coughs> Now, where is it? Over in Daniel, the fourth chapter? And that 1260 has a significance, a very big significance. I think it's Daniel 4 and 9. I don't remember right off the <coughs> I got it on my tablet.
12 and 10. Mm. Maybe it's not Daniel 4. Yeah, maybe it's 9. 9 and 21? Daily sacrifice? About daily sacrifice? Twelve sixty might be in Revelation. Daniel twelve eleven. Yeah, yep. Well, that's that's. Uh, that's what I was asking. Uh, Daniel twelve and. What was that? Oh, never mind. Yeah, uh, Daniel twelve and eleven. And from the time that daily, uh, and from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away, and the abomination that maketh desolate set up, there shall be a thousand. Two hundred and ninety days. Yeah, and the twelve sixty. Go back to verse seven. Twelve seven. Twelve and seven. And I heard the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, when he held up his right hand and his left hand unto heaven, and swear by him that liveth for ever that it shall be for a time, times and a half. And when he shall be accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people, all these things shall be finished. Keep going. Okay. So the time, times, and a half. Time is times, times, and a half. That's, that's a thousand years being a day with Yahweh, Second Peter 3 and 8. Right? So times is 1,000. And then times, which is 2,000. No. Huh? I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I'm, I'm, no, mess no, I'm messing that up. A time is a year, 360 days prophetic. Right. 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 And that's where we get the 1260 from. Because we got a, a, a year is 360 days. Right. And that's a time. And then times is two times that, which is, what, 720? Right. Mm -hmm. And then half a time, which is 180. Right. And that's what gives us the 1260. Right. Because what the 1260, there's representation of 1260 is also three and a half years and also 40 and two months mm -hmm. so right. all those are rep all these represent the same thing which is the time of Yahshua's ministry down here okay and that's where, where in Daniel the 11th verse when you get 1290 is he was 30 this is the length of his ministry which is the three and a half years plus how old he was when he started when he was 30 years old that's where you get the 1290 right. now those are shown in the tabernacle pattern by the, the 1260 inches from the gate to where the high priest stood five feet within the most holy place back here. That's the 1260. And if he makes a round trip, you end up with 2520, and that's the number that's on the pyramid back here. Now that's a super divine number, folks, because if you take 2520, and divide it by every you will come up with no remainder 
If you divide 2520 by every digit, you come up with a number with no remainder. So that has, that, that's a, a very special number, folks. Okay? So, um, that's, that's about all I have on the tabernacle pattern. Um, any questions or <laughs> comments? All right, I'm going to say thank you then. Our next speaker will be uh, Dr. Susan Craig. I almost feel like coming up here. Thank you very much. I enjoyed that and leaving. Um, because I don't know what to do with this. Um, except for, I guess I can just go over what I, how I understand the tabernacle pattern. Let's go, it's some correlative sticking with the tabernacle. Let's go get um, uh, Exodus uh, 25 and 8 and um, start there. Go over to 40, go down to 40. Exodus 25 and 8. Um, you know, the, I guess the thing is, is you know, um, you have to look at it like uh, what, what we've received here, this tabernacle pattern, is a very peculiar thing to the world. The world has not come up to this at all in anything. There's many things that the world, uh, sometimes you can see and, and, and read about or hear about, and you'll say, well, that's almost exactly what we're teaching down at the IDMR, and it'll be a tick off or a whole yard off or whatever, but they have not, con they don't go to this tabernacle pattern. Mm -hmm. And this tabernacle pattern that Moses was shown to build in the wilderness of Sinai is the, the um, it's the manifestation of Yahweh Elohim dwelling among us. And, and for them, it was dwelling among the Israelites. And, and this tabernacle pattern was nothing more than when, Yah, when Moses saw it. So go 25 and 8. Because Moses went up into the mount. And people don't even know what Moses went up in the mount to, to do. I mean, the Ten Commandments, they just said he went to got the Ten Commandment law. And that's, that's it. That's it. You don't, and they don't put, because you can't put this together right? You can't put this together. It's got to be by divine vision and revelation revealed to you. Okay, by, and really Yahweh uses the pattern to reveal it to you. So um, Moses went up there and he received the, um, the specifications of how to build this tabernacle in the wilderness of Sinai. But how, what did he see? So go get Exodus. Exodus 25 and 8. Uh-huh. And let them make me a sanctuary. And so when Yahweh shows, when Yahweh Elohim is giving Moses this divine vision and revelation, and he not only gave it to Moses, but he gave it to John, and he gave it to Dr. Henry Clifford Kinley. And thanks be to Yahweh that in 1931, Dr. Kinley received this divine vi vision and revelation and didn't say, well, that's too much for me. I can't do anything with that. <laughs> you know, Yahshua got right in him and said, teach the, your will, Yahweh. That's what Dr. Kinley endeavored to do. Now, he didn't just leave it like that. He gave it to anyone and everyone whenever he was with anyone. He used to say, preach this to your enemies. Give this to your enemies, not just your friends. Invite everyone because what's, what's determined for them if they don't receive this is nothing that they're going to want to have so, so for eternity. So, um, so he said, go ahead. And let them make me a sanctuary mm -hmm. that I may dwell among so them. So he said, let them make me a sanctuary down here in the wilderness of Sinai, where right now you all believe that you're going to build this sanctuary, right? And then you're going to go on up into Canaan land because they haven't that sent the spies out yet, right? Have they sent the spies out? They'd already sent the spies out, right? Before Moses went up here, had they sent the spies out? Okay, so right now, when, he's, when Yahweh's speaking to him, 
he's, a, he's looking at the fact that they're going to go down and build this sanctuary down here, but they're still traveling on up into Canaan land, and they're not going to go to Canaan land. This is a setup here. They're going to build this, this tabernacle in the wilderness, and they're, that Yahweh can dwell among them for 40 years. They're going to have to offer up sacrifices because, look at that, look at how Yahweh's got his sacrifice made before they've even done the sin. I mean, he's already got it set up for what they're going to have to do in here in the wilderness. Okay, so he says, let them make me a sanctuary, read. That I may dwell among them. Right. 40th verse. And look that thou make them after Now, he their doesn't pattern. just say, let them make me a sanctuary and go ahead and do it any old way you want. He says, go ahead. And look that thou make and them. And look that thou make them. After read, their pattern. After the pattern. Which right, was showed thee in the mount. After the pattern that was showed thee in the mount. And it says... And that pattern is Yahweh Elohim. And Yahweh Elohim transfigured into a uh, thoroughly furnished, intangible tabernacle pattern so that Moses could understand something about Yahweh Elohim as he really is and actually exists. And so now what Moses has to do is he's going to take that down here and he's going to build the tabernacle in the wilderness of Sinai, the same of what he had seen in the mount. Now, um, something. I just lost it too. Hang on. I was going somewhere and I just, it's gone. Okay, so he's going to have him build this tabernacle in the wilderness of Sinai according to what he saw in the mount. And so he's going to, when he gets down here, it's not going to just be up to him however he does this. Because what Yahweh does, and it says over there in Exodus, the 33rd chapter, I believe, that Yahweh puts his spirit in the craftsmen that had come with Moses and the children of Israel out of the wilderness of Sinai, or out of Egypt, into the wilderness. And he's going to have, the, he's going to put his spirit, is it in that 33? Be Be Beziel and Aholiab? And he's going to put his spirit right within these because, you know, they, these craftsmen are coming out of Egypt and they have some knowledge about how to, well, as Terry said, put a nail in the wall and put, it, and put the hammer to it. You know, uh, Terry doesn't have that craftsman's ability, but these men came out with all sorts of knowledge and understanding about how to build or, or build something, right? But they're not going to use what they know. He can't work with that. Go ahead. Did you find it? 30 or 33? Is it 31? Oh, oh. Okay. It's right at the beginning of 31 or 33. Yes. Okay, it's uh, Exodus 31 and 3. Thank you. And I have filled him with the spirit of Elohim. And he says, and I have filled them with the spirit of Elohim. So he's not even going to just leave it up to you. And that's just like here. We don't want to hear from you. You know, Dr. Kinley said, when any person is standing on this floor, you're seeing Yahshua speak to you. You better sit up and sit up straight. Yahshua speaking to you. You're going to have to discern if it's Yahshua or not speaking to you. But when that person's on the floor, you're not looking at that physical body. You should not be looking at what the theory, and you shouldn't be taking your own theories and opinions and giving it out either from up here. We don't care what you think and what your opinions are about anything. What we care about is this the divine vision and revelation straight up and straight on. That's it, right there. Paul said, I choose to know nothing among you save Yahshua the Messiah crucified. That's he, we, that's, you know, it's like, just forget. You're going to have to let the flesh go anyway. Might as well start doing it now. Okay, so he put this, go ahead, read that. And I have filled him with the spirit of Elohim uh -huh. in wisdom. And in understanding. And he's filled him with the knowledge and the wisdom and the understanding, read. And in knowledge mm -hmm. and in all manner uh -huh. of workmanship. In all manner of work, workmanship, so they're not going to have to figure this thing out. That's why what he just went through when he showed you all these numbers here, this isn't, these aren't his numbers. This tabernacle, this seven steps of the tabernacle is not his number. This 1290 is not his number. This 1260 is not his number. In Daniel 1335, that's not his number. These are the numbers that Yahweh gave men to understand something about him, but he had it by according to the tabernacle pattern. So he's going to have them build the tabernacle. And the tabernacle is going to have just like what he saw up there. You see, even, even, even Elohim himself had a head cavity, an abdominal cavity. And, or I mean a, a thoracic and abdominal cavity. 
three, okay, and here's the thing. What is this actually showing us something about? It's showing us the Trinity so that we can understand God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Because th that's what the world knows is Trinity. It's going to prove out a unity. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, these three are one. They are a unity. It says it right here. You go over in John 5, 7, 5, 7 and 8, 1 John 5, 7, 8. It says that these three bear witness. You better get it. I can't quote it. At least I know where it is. 1 John 5, 7. Right, the King James Version because... Okay. You got it in the King James Version, First John. And that's about the wor one of the most worldwide Bibles used is the King James Version. You know, these other Bibles, you know, there's, how many Bibles are there? There's thousands of editions of, of different kinds of Bibles and interpretations of men. Okay? Go ahead. First John 5 and 7. For there are three that bear record in heaven. Okay, so there are three that bear record in heaven. The Father, the Father, the Word, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are and one. And these three are one. Okay, and then the witnesses in the earth plane are the blood, the water, and the Spirit, and these three agree in one. Okay. All right. Now, what the tabernacle pattern does is it shows us how that Yahweh is the Father, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. These three are one. And and here's the thing. All right, so you had a most holy place, a holy place, and a court roundabout. Three tabernacles. No, it was one. Peter, back here, when he went up here with Yahshua, took, took them into a high place, and he transfigured before them in fulfillment of transfiguring before Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu in the, in, um, the, in, at the... I'm sorry, just, you know, whatever. Mount Ararat. So he's fulfilling it back here when Yahshua takes and transfigures before them. Peter says, pipes up, and then, you know, you, you've heard this, Peter Piper. Why, why, was it, why is it Peter? Peter pipes up and says, let us build here three tabernacles for you. One for you, Yahshua, one for Moses, and one for Elijah or John the Baptist. Let us build three. But that's not what this is. This is, a un this is pointing to a unity. Hey, and here's another thing. You see how they're all in white here? All this is in white, and all this is in white. This is showing them elevated, above, on the, on the plateau. They're above. So it's almost showing you how this is the court roundabout, the holy place, and the most holy place. See how it's colored? They're colored here, and they're in white as you go on up. It's showing them in an elevated situation. So. Now, you come over here and you go, you have a most holy place, a holy place, and a court round and round. You have a head cavity, a chest cavity, and an abdominal cavity. Man reflects that tabernacle pattern that he told Moses to go down in the wilderness and build so that they could, so that Yahweh could dwell among them. See, that's another thing. Yahweh, Yahshua said, lo, I am with you always. He's never left us, ever. He's never left his creation, ever. They say he went away, that he went up into Mount Olivet and he, he ascended into a cloud and that he went away and he's gone. He's gone. They don't, gone for 2,000 years and they're waiting for him to come back in like what manner, just like it says there, it come back in like manner on a cloud. Now how are you all going to see the one cloud that Yahshua determines to come down? Because it says every eye will see him. So it's not, that's not how it is. But it takes the tabernacle pattern and how man is made in the image and likeness of that tabernacle pattern to understand how Yahshua is going to come back on that cloud or in that cloud, just like he said back there to them when he left them. So, in the most holy place, you had the Shekinah that flashed. And this symbolized that Yahweh dwelling between the cherubim on the, on the um, Ark of the Covenant. Okay, So you come over here, and okay, and this is where... On the Day of Atonement, he showed himself to the high priest in atonement for the sins of, of the children of Israel for the year. Okay, so then you come over here and you have the most holy place, and you, in, in your head cavity, you have a brain. And that brain, when, it, when, blood is, when blood is coursing through that brain, it has this coloration 
of this cloud here that Yahweh dwells in, you understand, or that Yahweh represents the cloud man symbolizing eternity or Jerusalem above. So this is likened unto your brain, okay? When it, when it is, now when, it's, when you're dead, there's no longer that color, but it has a gray and white, it's gray and white matter, and that's how it looks without the blood coursing through it after you have passed. Okay, so now what you have within your brain is you have a pineal gland and you have a pituitary gland. Mm. Bring something up that I saw this year. Um, okay, so the pineal gland is like the all-knowing eye, knowing eye within your brain, okay? The pineal gland is sensitive to light. It does, a, it does a lot more than what people can really understand about the pineal gland, that, that even the scientists and the researchers haven't really figured out exactly what does that pineal gland. But it does have something to do with your light sensitivity and how you can be, um, you know, they'll, they'll encourage you to get, um, get outside and get some vitamin D or get some sunlight because that it will stimulate that pineal gland and cause you to have some well-being within your body. From, from being stimulated like that. So that pineal gland really co correlates to that, that Shekinah that flashed on that Day of Atonement that's right within your brain. Your body is gonna reflect things about this, ta this tabernacle pattern because this tabernacle pattern shows everything that there is to know about the universe. If you wanna really understand anything, put it on the pattern. And Yahweh, in simplistic ways, will show you how he is and actually exists by this tabernacle pattern. All right, so now if you, if the other thing I mentioned was the pituitary gland, and the pituitary gland, within that Ark of the Covenant, there was a law, that, that, this law that Moses got, the second tables of stone, that Ark of the Covenant had already been made because when he brought down the first tables, there was no Ark of the Covenant to place those within. But now there is an Ark of the Covenant, and he comes down and he places that law within the Ark of the Covenant. Just as your brain has a, pine or has a pituitary gland, there were seven laws on one side of that tables of stone, and there were three on the other. And so within your uh, pituitary gland, you have seven hormones that are secreted by one lobe and three hormones that are secreted by another. These things can be substantiated by you just doing a little bit of research, and all you're doing is you're just seeing the confirmation of Yahshua's existence. He's not gone away and not come back because on the day of, of uh, Pentecost, he poured out his Holy Spirit into the hearts and minds of these men that were here in the upper room, and then seven years, he gave it to the Gentiles on the day on um, um, baptism of the Holy Spirit in A.D. 40. So Jew and Gentile are, have access to the knowledge and understanding of Yahweh Elohim and that he's here dwelling in his tabernacles, that he has come, not that he is going to come, okay? So now you see how that correlates the brain and like that. Now there was something that I, I'm not sure if I can show this. Oh, I guess I'll show it. Okay, so now also within the brain, you have this arterial circle of Willis. This is where arteries come together in the brain in the formation of a man. Okay, they, they've actually, if you look at it, find it in a, in a medical dictionary, you can see how that arterial circle of Willis exists within the brain. And this is showing Yahweh Elohim in you. This is Yahshua. This is a manifestation of Yahweh dwelling in your cloud. Now, here's the interesting thing. If you look at the way they cross-section this, and I thought, this is really strange because we have never, we don't have that ability to do it right here. But if you look how they cross-section that arterial circle of Willis, right through that arterial circle of Willis is the pineal gland. And it's almost like right within the head region of that arterial circle of Willis, the pineal gland is right there at the base of that. So this is conf confirmation that Yahweh Elohim does exist. And within us, all these, it's so, it's so minute. If you just study anything about the physical body, you can, you, can see, you can see Yahshua all the way through it. And it is a great blessing to have been given this knowledge and understanding and, and be able to see these things, how Yahweh manifests himself now. It's a comfort. 
And he said, I am the comforter. Mm -hmm. It's a comfort to know when things get really rough and really hard in this world, and they do, that you can go back and you can see that Yahshua exists in any, he's just going to show himself if you look. But he's given us the tabernacle pattern. And that's the point, is that you think, well, how am I going to see, how am I going to see Yahweh in this? Just go back to it and look at it. When he, t when he showed you how Yahshua came out of heaven, down into the earth plane, and that he returned according to the tabernacle pattern, right? And then when he gets up there, see, look at that. When he comes right here to 2377, and he took you right to here, right? Now, he didn't stay there. Right here at this death, burial, and resurrection, he pours out the Holy Spirit in this age. And so here he is, and he's, all, he's doing a round trip. He comes down from heaven, he goes back into heaven, and now he comes back down. And now what is he doing? See, what he's doing is has, he's come out of heaven into superincorporeal, down into Yahshua, the, into the physical manifestation, Yahshua the Messiah. And now what he's doing is he's just going to return back. But he's not going alone. Because on this chart, you see him coming out of pure spirit and coming and manifesting in his creation. And now all his sons, because what he's done is he's bringing back, he's bringing back the wealth of Yahweh. And your souls are his wealth. And he's bringing that back unto the Father. And so you see here all these angels right here gathering around Yahshua. These are type and shadow of the sons of Yahweh Elohim gathered back into the body of Yahshua the Messiah to be given back to the Father. With that, I say hallelujah. Concludes our lecture for today. I, any comments or questions? Very, enjoyed it. Very good class. Um, we hold classes here every Wednesday and Friday from 7 p.m. at night to 9 p.m. and every Sunday from 11 to 1. We do have a convention coming up over here in Chicago on the 9th, I think it is, 8th through the 10th, April 8th through the 10th in Chicago. Mm -hmm. Yep, mm -hmm. and something coming up in Florida, but I, that's in August. So um, we can all stand and be dismissed. What? Oh, after question, after class, question is on the 18th of March. That's next week. Nope. Yes, I think. Two weeks away. Okay, we can all stand and be dismissed. And I'll be quoting the last two scriptures <coughs> in the uh, book of Judah. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise Yahweh, our Elohim, to Yahshua the Messiah, our Sovereign, belong glory, majesty, dominion, and power, both now and forever. Let us all say, Hallelujah. Hallelujah.
of the world. You see, he told Jeremiah, I made you a prophet long before. This earth had shape without form before it was void. Yeah. He said, I possessed your ways before I made the deep blue sea. I am the cause, the reason for it all, and all I had to do was be. Yes, I am the cause, the reason for it all, and all I had to do was be. They don't know he's in complete control. L.O.M. is running his show, yeah. He's in complete control. Temperance, joy in the Holy Spirit. 
Just enough for me. 